Getting the best out of our teams means setting our expectations in a way that enables people to achieve their best, enables them to perform and be the best that they can be. In this video, I'm going to give you some tips on exactly how you can do that, how you can do it in a neuro-inclusive way, so when we're thinking about our neurodiverse team members as well, and how that benefits everybody. So it's not just those with neurodiverse conditions. These tips will benefit everybody and will make your team better performers. So quick introduction to who I am first for those who haven't seen my videos before. I'm Jennifer, I'm the founder of Silk Helix and we're a HR consultancy that specializes in neurodiversity. So diving straight into how we get the best out of our teams. Because ultimately when we're paying people to do a job, that's what we want. We need the best, we need a return on our investment. So Getting that and achieving that is really crucial to making sure that our businesses work and how we do that matters. When we're really clear on what our expectations are, we're clear on what we can see the outcome to be, we're going to set much better expectations to our team. We're going to be much clearer about it to them. And there's a fine line between being really clear on what we need the outcomes to be and micromanaging. We don't want to be micromanaging people. It's not healthy. It's not going to create a workforce that is satisfied, is motivated to do their role. So really what we're looking at is what is it that the outcome is going to look like? And then how can we empower people to go out and do the job and do what they need to be doing? Firstly, before we're even thinking about setting expectations or any kind of instructions, we need to know our team. We need to know what makes them tick. We need to know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, how they like to be communicated with, how they like to receive instructions, what matters to them so that we can get the best out of them. And then we can adapt our management style to suit the needs of the individual. That's absolutely got to be our starting point. And be willing as a manager to adapt I think traditionally we've often talked about management as having kind of our own management style and it's like that's my style that's it the reality is the people that we're managing are what matter so our style needs to fit their needs in order that we get the best out of them so when we know that that really helps and that can be things like does somebody need the instructions verbally do they need them written down? Are they more of a visual learner and therefore something visual will really help? Do they need a combination of those? So perhaps giving them verbally and then followed up in writing. All of these things really matter in terms of making sure that we get the message across because when it comes to communication, we've only communicated if somebody receives the information that we needed them to receive. That's the communication. doesn't matter that we've delivered it. doesn't matter that we've given the instruction. What matters is did they receive it? And there's tools that can help us with that now. So let's say we're using video calls, for example. We're able to record the calls, which means somebody can play back to remind themselves. We can get transcripts of those calls. So there's things that we can use that enable us to do this without putting in lots of extra time than it might be to give somebody the instructions both verbally and in writing. Or a quick sort of follow-up email, making sure there's action points, that kind of thing. Also making sure that we consider how somebody reacts to to change or reacts to sudden things that come up in their day. So for example, just a, can I have a quick chat? For some people that will be absolutely fine. For other people that will be really either terrifying or it will really break the flow of their concentration, their day and meetings should be planned in advance. And we should also know in advance, why am I being called into your office for a quick chat? What is it that you want to talk about? Because that again can really help ease any anxiety about what that chat might involve or what could be going wrong. Because for some people, there'll be all sorts of things going through their mind. Watch my video on RSD and rejection sensitivity dysphoria and feedback and you will get a lot more information on why that can be so problematic. And then there's looking at how we give regular support to people. So regular checkings, for example, making sure that they actually understand, not just saying, do you understand, but making sure that they kind of recap and let you know what they're doing, where they're up to. Because again, that can be really helpful for you to make sure that they're on the same page, that the picture in their mind of what they're trying to achieve is the same as the picture in your mind. And making sure that we've done that in such a way that people feel supported rather than, again, micromanaged. There's a fine line between them sometimes, but it's how we do it. It's how we have those communications. 
And using techniques like coaching, where we ask questions, where we let them take the lead, we empower people rather than just barking orders or giving instructions and really monitoring sort of right down to the the minute details letting people have control of that is really important and really useful to people again but making sure that we we recognize people's individual needs as well and individually what works best for somebody in order to get the best out of them one of the ways that we can make sure that people get from us what it is that we intended to convey is to be really clear in our meaning so using language that is really direct in terms of this is what we need the outcome to be. And in terms of giving feedback as well, really direct in terms of if we're giving negative feedback or feedback where something needs improving, that we're really specific around what that is. Watch my video on the aid model. I love that model. I think it's a really useful tool and I go into it in more detail in this video on which covers the aid model, how you can use it to get the best out of people, certainly in terms of feedback, but it's also worth thinking about in terms of how we give instructions as well. And whilst I'm a huge fan of the aid model and think it's really useful, that over the kind of feedback sandwich, which you've, if you've watched some of my videos, you'll have heard me criticise before, is really important because it is direct, it is really clear what we're talking about in this situation. Having said that, when it comes to the kind of feedback sandwich, that positive, negative, positive, whilst I don't think we should ever be giving feedback in a sandwich in that way, it's not helpful. We should be making sure that we've got positive feedback, that two to one positive feedback. When we're giving somebody positive feedback, we're reinforcing the value that they've got within the team. We're motivating them. We're encouraging them. We're encouraging the positives, the things that we want replicated. Because if somebody doesn't know what they've done well, they can't replicate it in the same way as if they don't understand their mistakes they can't correct them or not do that in future we have to learn from both the positives and the negatives it's really important that we've got that culture of positive feedback that culture of positive feedback will also mean that, that people are more likely to come to us with challenges they're more likely to tell us when something's not going right or when they they want to feedback to us in terms of how we are as managers when they want to disclose say a neurodivergent condition or something where they've just got a different style they want to work with and they when you've got that positive relationship it makes all of these things much easier to talk about and therefore much easier to solve and work around when we all know and understand what's going on and don't forget if somebody does disclose to you that they're neurodivergent and we, whichever that may be or that that has an impact on work or indeed a physical disability or indeed they're not using that language, but it appears that they are. As an employer, you have a duty to make reasonable adjustments. I've got some specific videos again on reasonable adjustments and how you can make reasonable adjustments. It's so really important that we're thinking about that, but it could be things like making sure that sensory needs are met. So thinking about the environment as to where we have physical meetings, thinking about whether cameras are on, cameras are off, and say whether something is done verbally, in writing, both, all of these things could be reasonable adjustments and it would certainly be expected that as managers we adapt our style in order to suit somebody's needs and that that is a reasonable adjustment. It's not going to cost us a huge amount to do that. Most of these reasonable adjustments don't cost huge amounts but they are so important to getting the best out of somebody which ultimately means as a business that we're able to value and get the best out of people's strengths. So I've mentioned there a few other videos that are worth checking out. I've also got a guide on performance which does also look at neurodiversity, neuroinclusivity when we're talking about performance. Check out the link in the description below to be able to access that free guide and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.